three options, doctor, dentist, or a solicitor. Stand-up comedy was never on that list. I'm on Celebrity MasterChef. Look at her making those chapatis. My God, I taught her well. With comedy, it's healing, it's laughter, it brings joy, it's a release. Hi, welcome to Changing Suits. My name's Belle. And my name's Ted. On this week's episode, I'm quite excited. I'm going to, I said earlier to our guest that I'm going to contain my excitement, but we'll see how it goes for the rest of the podcast because you know me, I'm a bit emotionally crazy sometimes. So today we've got the lovely Shazia Mirza on. Hi, Shazia. How are you doing today? Hi. Hi. It's great. Thank you for having me on here. No worries. So, when um, I've spoken to Taj about finding guests, I've always been like, look, we need someone really funny. And when she said your name, I was like, you're lying to me. Yeah, you did have to double check my messages and make sure I was telling the truth, which I won't be offended by, to be honest. Well, you did hound me on Instagram and I thought, this woman is not going to stop stalking me. I just, oh, OK, I just... I'm well known for that, to be honest. <laughs> I'll just say, yeah, okay, to shut her up. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much how most people work with Taj. <laughs> so today we want to discuss with you, what is it like being a South Asian within the whole realm of comedy? What got you there? Well, it was, you know, obviously not planned. As you know, South Asian women and men, you know, they were only ever three options, doctor, lawyer, dentist or a solicitor or something respectable stand-up comedy was never on that list I never saw any South Asian women on TV when I was growing up and and then later on when South Asian women did come on to telly they were always reading the news and that was considered to be like if you're going to be on TV just read the news you know that's an acceptable thing for an Asian woman to do and it's it's so funny now because I think that stereotype of Asian women has been ingrained into people, not just other Asians, but like black people, white people, just ordinary everyday people see Asian women in a particular role. So like I remember a few years ago, I was on holiday on, in the Caribbean and I was walking down this beach and this woman ran up to me and she went, I know you. I know you from somewhere. Where do I where do I know you from? I do know you. But then she, and then she said, I know who you are. You're my GP. Oh God. How did you take that? Because I thought at that point I would have been like, it. You are I'm my GP. It. Did you get your steps to and, then, and start giving her a general um, I thought it was so funny. I actually Done a, did a routine about this, about how everybody thinks I'm I'm everyone but me. No one ever says to me, you're Shazia Mirza. I'm always Malala, Mira Sayal, other people. I last week I was I was in Birmingham and I was parking my car and this guy, just this ordinary young white guy, he knocked on my window and he went, God, I know you. Hi. Yeah. Do you work for the prison service? That's, Is that one of the, that's not one of the three on the list, though, to be fair. That's very different. <laughs> Why? Do you work for... How do I know you? Do you work for the prison service? So you got away from him very slowly. I'm <laughs> like, oh, gosh. It's gone from GP to prison service. What next? But no one ever goes... I mean, some, when I'm in the... Like, when I was in the supermarket the other day, people people stare at me a lot. And they cannot um, work it out. Where do I know you from? Do you think you should get a black thing? Were... I am a comedian. The interesting thing is, before you were a comedian, you were actually a teacher, weren't you? So you're not completely off the radar of what your parents... Yeah, but nobody ever says to me, are you my teacher? Were you my teacher? But then, Charlie, did you have the same pressure from your parents and relatives of doing those three things, which all of us had, you know, doctor, yeah, yeah. lawyer? Did yeah, I did. I did. But obviously, you know, I'd, there was no role models on TV. Like I said, there was no women doing other things. That Everybody was towing the line, you know, for a, for a very long time until recent times. It, you know, that's what you saw Asians in those roles. And that's what 
that's why I think, you know, when people stop me in the street, it's because they've also seen Asian women in just those roles. And so they can't see, seem to see us outside of that. That's why when I come on stage now, People are always surprised, you know, to see an Asian woman, a Muslim woman doing stand up. And it was all, it was such a big deal for such a long time because not only was I, you know, the only one doing it, it was also that the audience were, you know, for the first time, they were they were seeing me for the first time. It's not like they'd seen like loads of Asian women doing stand-up. So it was new for me to do, but it was also new for them to see. And to be honest, when I started watching you, I was like, oh my God, there's an Asian woman. And I was almost addicted to watching your comedy that you were doing. And it was just one after the other, because it was just, oh my God, it can be done. An Asian woman can become a comedian. So that was inspiring in itself. Now there are, there's, there's a few, but still not loads. You know, but loads compared to when I started. You know how certain roles, and we've discussed this previously with other guests, where perhaps they're in corporate roles or other roles, where perhaps Asian, they might have been taken on as, I'm going to say the word, a token Asian. Is that the same sort of thing within the comedy realm? Because obviously there are not a massive uh, lot of um, South Asians doing it. There are very well-known people. But do you find that is a thing within the comedy realm? Well, in comedy, it's different because, you know, you've got to be funny. So they can't just, like, pick you, for give you a gig because you're Asian. You've got to be funny. You've got to deliver the goods, you know. You can't just stand up and say, look, I'm an Asian, will you take me on? You've got to be funny. And and comedy's really hard. It's hard. Everything about it is hard. And you have to work at it for years to become good at it. And so, you know, maybe... These days, you know, things have changed because of Black Lives Matter and feminism and, you know, equal opportunities, diversity. It is a big thing now. And, you know, on panel shows, on comedy shows, you do see more diverse comedians than you've ever seen before. But those comedians still have to be funny. You can't just just sit there and go, I'm a nation woman, you know, put me on this. You got you got to be good. Can we go back right from the beginning? What was your upbringing like? Because you said it was a traditional mm. upbringing. What what is that? What do you mean by that? Well, I was born up, brought up in Birmingham um, in the nineties, and I are you not going to do a whoop whoop, Shazia? Whoop whoop, Birmingham. Birmingham no. <laughs> is great now. It's oh. great now. Oh. When I was growing up there. It was, well, bombs did go off. I mean, they were, you know, the IRA blew up the rotunda. It was like dark. It was grim. You know, it was, there was, and you know, they were, Birmingham has always had everything. You know, it's it's got the black community, Afro-Caribbean community. It's got a lot of Irish. It's got a lot of Indians, a lot of Pakistanis, and now lots of Eastern Europeans. It's like Birmingham has always had everybody from every different background, every different culture. And, you know, you get shops in different areas like the Soho Road, Stratford Road, Ladypool Road, where you get foods from different backgrounds. That's why I was always growing up in Birmingham, eating different foods and going to different restaurants because we always had that because the immigrants came over in the 60s and 70s, you know, set up the Balti Belt, set up all these Indian restaurants and stuff. And that's what Birmingham became famous for. So I always grew up in this, like, you know, melting pot. I've always had like Irish friends. I went to school with Irish friends, Sikh friends, Hindu friends. You know, I, we always knew other people and different types of people. And that was normal to us. And now I think, you know, that was such a privilege, such an honor, you know, to be growing up with loads of different people from different backgrounds because it's just normal to me that I knew people like that. And we're still friends now. And it was really great, but it was grim. People were poor. There was no, you know, there was no really rich people. It was like all the people we knew were working class. A lot of them were immigrants. But we had things like the Bull Ring, which was great. The Bull Ring Market is famous in Birmingham. And it's great because, you know, yeah. you can get anything you want. You can get like a bag of fish and a bag of knickers for a pound. Everything is a pound. It's like so diverse, you know. You can get anything you want. You can get like a bag of fish and a bag of knickers for a pound. Everything is a pound. It's like so diverse, you know. You can go in there and get kitchen utensils and then, 
you know, you go in there, you, you, in those days, you know, the 90s, you could <laughs> get a real fur coat and then you'd walk past and you'd see like a chopping board and you'd think, oh, yeah, that's great, let me get that. And then you'd like get a bag of stockings or Christmas cards and everything was always a pound. <laughs> and it was really great because you could barter with people and go, oh, you know, if I buy these knickers and I buy this chopping board, can I have them for 150 And they'd always go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I loved like... I love like that background of like people were very flexible, you know, and not like nowadays, you know, you go into a shop and if something is ten ninety nine, you've got to pay ten ninety nine for it. In those days you could really barter. You could really, you know, you could go in and say, Look, can I have this? I was gonna say, you know inflation took hold when you went from one pound to ten ninety nine though, Shazia, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> but but also in back then, you know, if you wanted like to buy a TV and you and it was like hundred and fifty pounds. You could say, "Look, can I pay you five pound a week?" And they'd go, "Yeah, all right then." And you 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 get the TV, and then you'd just be paying it off for the rest of your life. Whereas now, you know that kind of thing it doesn't happen. But growing up, you you saw all these kind of things, people bartering, you know, because everybody was just trying to survive then. Birmingham was poor; it was deprived. But you know, I go back there now. And it's quite, there's a lot of affluent people. It looks quite nice now that it's finished. They've done it up. The ball ring looks amazing. But, and, and I come home and I hear the accent. I hear the accent and there's something like, oh, nostalgic. And, and, then, and, and, then, and then it's really weird. I could spend a week there and I start talking Birmingham as well. And people say to me, like I met this guy once. And he said to me, where are you from? I said, I'm from Birmingham. He said, can you speak Birmingham? I said, it's not a language. It's, not, it's like, a, it's a city and it's an accent, but it's not a language. He said, can you speak Birmingham? Can, I can understand what you mean, because I've got a nephew and niece and they're actually staying with us and they, they're from Warsaw. And my children start speaking Warsaw. Birmingham? <laughs> This is the language thing. Accent. But they do the have accent. the accent. And I'm trying to do it as well. And I'm like, okay, why am I doing this? <laughs> but Shazi, can I just ask, do you think you've still got the accent? Because from my point of view, I've, you've definitely got it. I've been in Birmingham for about three weeks now. And oh. you know what? When you go to Birmingham and if you don't have the accent, people think that you're up your own ass. People think that, oh, oh you, really? you, 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 yeah. you, you're in London, you don't live here anymore, you, you're in London. But Shazia, what's really interesting is, you know, in regards to our podcast, the reason we started it was very much to look at how the Eastern and the Western culture sort of sort of combined and came together because we are living in, in the UK and how, you know, our parents and family have had an effect on us. How would you say, you know, there's things you've already mentioned in regards to Birmingham being that melting pot. But for you, did you find there was a divide and did you find it difficult to overcome that divide or how did you overcome it? The Western and the Eastern cultures, because they are, as we know, very different. Well, like for us, if you're born here, it's it's different. I think if like my mum's generation, she came over. From, my mum was born in India, in Gujarat, in Jalandhar, in between, before partition. And, and then she went from India to Pakistan, married my dad, and then came from Pakistan to Birmingham. So not much difference, really, <laughs> Pakistan to Birmingham. I mean, they integrated really well. And, and the thing is, they, um, I think for her generation, it probably was like a real culture shock. For us that are born here, I think it's different. Obviously, we have our parents' influence. But my par- my mum really tried to integrate, you know, those first wave of of immigrants that came over, they really tried to integrate. They were like the first generation over here. They worked really hard. They set up the shops and the warehouses and the businesses, and they really wanted to make their mark. It's different for us because we were born here and educated here. So, like, I, I was able to become a comedian. Like, nobody from my mum's generation would ever have done that because the avenues weren't there for them. The first wave of Asian women, immigrants that came over in the 60s and 70s, I think they're they're different to the waves of immigrants that come over now because they were the first and they really wanted to make a mark. 
and they were the first generation who, who set up the shops and the warehouses and businesses and they really wanted to be successful and they wanted their kids to be successful like they wanted us my generation your generation you know, to be successful so they worked really hard but I, they really wanted to integrate you know like my mum, she would wear shalwar kameez, yeah, or a sari. And then she'd go in and out to the hairdresser and say, you know, can I have a Princess Diana haircut? Because all the Asian women of that generation thought they were Princess Diana. Because, you know, they related to their marriage with Charles. They were like, oh, well, you know, I had an arranged marriage as well. My husband was 20 years older than me and he didn't really love me. He was having an affair with some other woman. And I had to produce an heir and a spare and a spare and a spare. And a, I had to produce all the boys. And, you know, that's my life. I'm Princess Diana. So I think every Asian woman of my mother's generation thinks she's Princess Diana. And I think the Asian community was so obsessed with Diana. They are obsessed. They are so... I did love her, to be honest. No, at home, I so at my house in Birmingham, mm. we would have, like, bags of basmati rice in the hallway. And then on the walls, plates with Charles and Di on it. So our... Her, a lot, picture of Charles and Di on the TV for them from their engagement, you know, in the blue dress in 1981. And then bags of basmati rice and chapati flour in the hallway. And I think, God, this is so, like, integrated of the Asian community. This is what they used to do. And I think, you know, when Diana was going to, when Diana got with Dodi and when she got with Hasnat Khan, the Pakistani heart surgeon, like the Asian community knew well, knew everything. They knew what was happening. They were like, they were like the Walking Talking Hello magazine. They knew be they knew before it even came out in Hello what was going on. <laughs> Do you think Diana actually wanted to be an Asian woman, if nothing else? Then uh, how many times did she wear like shalwar kameez everywhere to put yeah. her on her head? Always go. She just secretly went to meet Hasnat Khan's mother in Pakistan by herself. I know. There we are. And everybody knew about it. Like my relatives in Birmingham knew about it. They probably knew what flight she was on. Diana's going over now. She's over now. She's going to, she's going to visit Hasnab Khan's mom. Oh my God. So everybody knew everything. But it was different then, like our generation now. You know, a lot of our parents are not alive or they're really old or, you know, we definitely, you know, a lot of us don't have grandparents anymore. And our generation is different, I think. You know, with with the fact that obviously you were brought up in Birmingham mm. when things were very hostile. You know, it sounds like your family did you yeah. really did try to integrate. I mean, what yeah. else do you need? Your mum was getting the Diana haircut. You don't need anything else. So they were. Would you say that they were more forward thinking, as in because of that integration, you found it easier to go into comedy than someone perhaps that wasn't. No, I I, I found it really hard to go into comedy because even though like you know we were told to be doctors dentists lawyers something respectable even though we were told to do those things it was still hard to do and it was still hard to be accepted because you know there is there was racism you know there wasn't kind of diversity there wasn't equal opportunities women especially asian women were not seen in positions of power or on TV or, you know, so it was hard. It was always hard. You know, I'm sure your parents used to say you've got to work twice as hard as your English friends because, you know, it's harder for us. And in those days, there were so many barriers, you know, especially for Asian women, there were so many barriers. But where did those barriers come from, Shazia? Was it more from the white community or would you say there was a lot of barriers from the South Asian community as well, or both? Well, I think it was racism, obviously. There was, there was also classism. Yeah. There was also colonialism, you know, that that we had to live mm -hmm. with, that we were second class citizens, that we were guests in this country and, you know, we owned you and all this. All the kind of things that black people have had. But I feel like black people and the black community have progressed a lot more, especially in recent times, because, you know, they've really stood up for themselves and they've really had to fight uh, against things and you know they've had Black Lives Matter and, and and big movements like that and whereas the Asian community we haven't had such great big movements like that 
Why do you think that is? Why do you feel that we haven't stood up enough or we just accept it and are taught to accept things and just carry on? We have a different culture. Um, we do have a, a different culture where, you know, to respect other people and to not be so vocal about things. Just shut up, keep your head down, move on, work hard. You know, don't cause any trouble. Don't bring shame on the community. Don't show your parents or your family up. And so our culture is a bit different. So we haven't been as vocal. Uh, also with Asian women, we have so much to contend with, you know, in terms of like marriage and is earth and kind of, you know, you know, if we do something wrong, our parents will get the punishment for it. And and also to do with honour and to do with, you know, well, it's our parents. How was it being in, because you've got three brothers, am I right? Yeah. Yeah. And how was it bring, being brought up in a family where there were three brothers and then yourself, the only girl in the family? I, it makes you... I think it makes you a different person when you are when you grow up with sisters. If you, like if I'd had five sisters, it'd probably I'd be different. Growing up with brothers, you know, you have to fight to be heard. You uh, really don't understand things. Like I couldn't understand why my brothers were allowed to do things and I wasn't. What do you mean? What What were they allowed to do that you weren't allowed to do? Well, like sport. I I love sport. You know, I was the sports captain at school. And I loved sport. I loved hockey, tennis, athletics, swimming. Uh, but like my brothers, they, they were allowed to go to like after school clubs, you know, where they could play cricket or, you know, they could play football for county and stuff like that. Whereas I wasn't allowed to do any of that, you know. And I really wanted to. But then did you get... Did you get an explanation from your family? Did you ever ask the whys? Because that's something that's very different now than before. Yeah, like I just, yeah, they would just say, girls don't do that. Do you think that in our time we were more accepting? We were like, okay, they've said don't do it, we won't do it. But with the next generation, they question everything. Do you think it's a different generation now and things have progressed in that respect? Yeah, I think now women are stronger. I think our, women, our mother's generation, they had a lot to contend with, I think. You know, they uh, most of them had arranged marriages. You know, they they didn't they weren't on these uh, they weren't on Tinder. They didn't have these dating apps. You know, where they could swipe left and swipe right and have the privilege to do that. I mean, they were a lot of them were you know arranged marriages. Like my mum, she met my dad twice, I think, before they got married. She was a lucky woman. Some of them just sat down and got married. I know. Some of them were just on the wedding day, wasn't it? They just yeah. saw the face revealed was on the wedding day. And that, you know, that's kind of unheard of now where you, you just meet your husband on your wedding day. And even if it was, I think women are so much stronger now. They'd go, sod off, I'm not doing that. I'm not going out with him. I'm not marrying him. Women are stronger. They're more vocal. They fight for their rights more. They take less shit. You know, our mother's generation took so much shit, yeah. really. Just put up with it. And in a way, you could say they were very strong. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, like you could say, my God, I wouldn't have lasted 10 minutes in that marriage or I wouldn't have lasted with this man. So in a way, I, could, I was always struggling to fight, to say, were my mother's generation strong or weak? Because I used to think, God, they're weak, you know. Why didn't they stand up to him? Why didn't they just leave? But where, like like my mum says, you know, where would they have gone? Where was there for them to go? They didn't have refuges or Asia or women, domestic violence charities or phone lines or people to talk to. I mean, we have all of that. We, you know, we are, we've progressed so much and that's, in a way, you could say they were strong. In a way, you could say they were weak. But I, I think nowadays, we just don't put up with any shit. In regards to the fact that a lot of your comedy very much talks about the culture, how has that been taken by the South Asian community? Because, you know, some of the things you say is very much like, oh, that's a very interesting thing to say. But how, how, what's the response on your end? What's your social media saying? What are people that you're talking to saying to you? People... 
really actually love it now. I think it's because, you know, when I started comedy, I was the only Asian woman doing it. And the audiences were all white. Like there was no Asian circuit or black circuit or, you know, but now you get really a lot of Asian comedy nights. You get a lot of Asians coming to watch comedy, young people. And also now we obviously have social media. We have like Instagram, TikTok and videos. My videos are shared all over the world. Like I remember I toured India about five times. I had such an amazing time. I loved it so much. I toured all over. And the only people that saw me were people that saw me, like in the gig. But now I do a video, I put it on the internet, and like the whole of India has seen it by the next day. And they've all shared it and liked it. And, you know, all it's so quick and it's so easy to get a mass audience now just from online. Whereas back in the day, you know, I used to kind of, you know, just do the gigs and the only people that saw me or heard about me were people that read the Times of India or they had watched me in the gig. But now it's just I've got such a big audience because of social media. In regards to, because you did say earlier, you know, the Asian community have been quite positive and are coming to see you. I'm not going to put the negative because social media also has the downside, but we're not going to talk about that. How has been, how's the white community taken to you, especially now when social media goes crazy and you are very well known. So you're not just the GP that someone thought they, they had, but you're, you know, in your own right, a, a comedian. How's the white community taken to it? Because you do talk about cultural issues. They love it actually, but they always did because you know how they see like Asian women when we do something like, I say we are, yeah, like a comedian or we are, uh, I don't know, a journalist or a barrister or something. You know, like these white middle class guardian leaders will come up to you and they'll go, oh, my God, you are so brave, so brave. It's amazing what you're doing. Oh, so incredible. You're so amazing. Your parents must be so, you're, you're so your parents Why do you must be so your brain? proud. Yeah. I'm so proud. It's like, I don't know what. We don't talk like that in London, Shazia. You're doing the whole overemphasis of the accent. <laughs> the people I meet in the street, oh, you're so brave. You know, they think that, you know, doing comedy, I'm brave <laughs> because I don't know what they think. I, Why is that? Yeah. I think they, they have a stereotype of how we are and how we're brought up and how our families are and also how... There was never any Asian faces on TV for years and years and years until now that they think, wow, what must you have been through to get here? But then don't you find that really interesting? And and that that's the sort of thing I was trying to sort of wondering. If they sort of have that stereotype, do you then get the slight sense that there is, you know, we're always talking about the over the last few weeks because of the colonialism and the partition anniversary, we've spoken about the whole white hierarchy and obviously that sort of structure that not only goes on here in the UK, but it goes on around the world. Do you feel that there's a slight hint of racism or is it just the fact that you're raising awareness? Yes, you're doing it in a funny way, but they're sort of seeing that they would have thought that it was all negative what you went through. But in essence, it wasn't completely all negative. You know, like comedy is really about bringing joy to people. It's about making people happy and about making people laugh. You know, I'm in the business of making people laugh. I'm not here to make anybody's life a misery. You know, I don't go on stage and think, oh, who can I, who can, whose life can I ruin tonight? You know, it's all. Some of the comedians think that. I've seen that on stand up. It's quite scary being on the front row. I, well, we're not out. We're in the business of making people laugh. We want people to be happy. We're not here to bring misery to people. So I always see it as, you know, I'm here to bring some joy to you. If you turn that into some kind of misery, it's your problem because I'm not here with that intention, you know. And I do sometimes have people stop me in the street and say thank you. It's mainly, it is mainly white people because they do, they grew up with comedy. It's in their history, you know, Monty Python, Faulty Towers, you know, all these famous sitcoms, Porridge, Only Fools and Horses. We've We've had a history 
of comedy in Britain since time began. So they do appreciate comedy. And I have honestly, I've had a lot of people stop me in the street when they don't think I'm the, the GP or Malala or Mira Sale. When, when they do stop me in the street, sometimes they go, thank you. Thank you. And that must be an amazing feeling to think that you're bringing joy to people's lives. Well, that, that the thing is with me is that that is what I'm here for. I'm here for the laughs, aren't I? I'm, I'm here to to create laughter. And so when people say to me, oh, thanks for the laughs, it's just, it's great, really. That Because that, that's what I do. That's my job. So you do talk about quite a few sensitive topics. Have you ever had any backlash from our community? Not to my face. You know what it's like. They always love going behind your back, don't they? As long as you don't know about it, who cares? It's all good. I mean, they they kind of like writing stuff, don't they? They love to email you, uh, email me and go, oh, you know, you're not funny. Well, thanks for letting me know. It's been going quite well so far, but you don't find me funny. Okay, fine. Don't watch me. But they, I never have anybody say it to my face. How about your family and your loved ones? Obviously, like Taj said, you do talk about very, you know, quite sensitive topics and they can be controversial have your family ever worried for you or ever said to you Shazian perhaps you want to tone that part of the comedy down or has it been like no go for it do what you need to do they've never seen me uh live they do watch me on tv I'm on celebrity masterchef at the moment and they have been watching every every single episode with great interest that's because it's master chef. It's like, oh, my girl is in the kitchen. It's fantastic. I know. Look at her making those chapatis. My God, I taught her well. <laughs> oh, my mum did look at one the other day. And she went, that one is not quite round, but I think you got away with it. <laughs> we all get that comment, don't we? <laughs> not quite round. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I didn't have a compass. Sorry. Uh, they are, yeah, you know, they do watch everything I do on TV. They like to watch it on TV. It's a safe space, you know. If it gets too rude, they can always turn it off. But in real life, I think it would be a bit too much for them, you know. Why do you think it would be too much for them? Well, they never really grew up with comedy, did they? They they just didn't really grow up with it. It's not part of our culture. And how about if, if you had someone that came to you and said, look, I want to get, in, get into the comedy scene from the South Asian community. I mean, it is a lot easier than it used to be. What advice would you give them? Well, this is something that they really have to want to do. You know, it's got to be a real love for it and a passion for it because it's really hard and you've really got to put the work in. How many years were you doing, because obviously you were teaching prior to being a comedian. How many years? I was teaching, no, I I was teaching at the same time that I actually started comedy. And how many years before, before you know, you got to a place where you're like, I, I'm actually really comfortable with this. I think I can do this. How long was it before you did leave your teaching career and say, I am going to make a career out of comedy? Oh, it, it was it was a long time, you know. It was a really long time. It was really, really... God, it was so long. I mean, I, I've been doing comedy... Well, I had been doing comedy about seven years. Um, And I was teaching at the same time. And then I went part time, Mm. still teaching. Then eventually I left. But it was, you know, it was a gradual thing. I didn't just give up my job and say, I'm going to be a stand up comedian. And you must never do that, you know, because comedy is hard and you've got to work at it. That is a nice bit of advice, isn't it? This You've got to work at it. OK, and it's not like uh, um, Asians can be a bit intellectual about things and go, you know what, if I just do a comedy course or I write some comedy for a year, I can go out and make millions. It's not like that. You've really got to graft. And sometimes you've got to graft for no money, you know. What do you mean graft? What does it mean? Being a comedian, grafting, what does that mean? Is it going to the comedy it means you've got to go on. You've got to go on stage every night. Do five minutes here, five minutes there. Try out some new material. Write some new material. Construct a show. Uh, gig every night. So ten minutes a night. Trying out new material. You've got to really write new stuff. You've got to go to Edinburgh. You've got to do gigs for no money for a long time. It's really hard. 
and men mental health wise because it took you so long to get to the stage that you are how how have you found it was it tiring through the process was it at any point did you think right this is too much I'm going to pack it in or did you just carry on going steaming ahead Oh, no. I mean, there were so many ups and downs. There were so many hard times. There were so many difficult times. You know, there were so many lonely times. There were times you thought, oh, my God, you know, why don't I just give up and get married like my mum told me to? I think, you know, just because that's always the back, the, the backup plan. It's, well, if you get it right, it can be a very good plan, you know, because the thing is, if you get a good husband, I mean, look, you can... You know, if you marry well, you can really have quite a good life. If you just want a nice house and kids and nice clothes and nice holidays, if that's all you want in life, if you marry well, you can get all of that, you know. But if you actually want to do something yourself, make a mark in the world, change something, have some impact, help people, then you have got to put that work in yourself. It's something that you can't really marry into. Yeah. It depends what you want in life. And our mother's generation only had one option, which was to marry well. And, and it was a bit of a lottery who, who got the good ones and who got the bad ones. Um, so can then I ask you what it is that you want, just out of interest, because you've made a really important point there in regards to what it is you know, that people want out of life, what kind of impact are you trying to create, especially with the comedy that you're, you're going out there, you're talking about culture, you, you're, you're trying to make people happy. What, what's the impact that you want to create in this world, I guess? Well, I love, I love comedy. You know, that's my, that's my medium that I do everything through is through comedy. So I, if I want, if I have something to say, if there's something I'm angry about, I want to write about it, if I want to, you know, write a book or write a TV show, whatever my subject or topic is, I can always do that in the form of comedy. That's my avenue. And I can yeah. do, I can say things, serious things or dark things, and I can make people laugh at the same time as saying those things. So I can get those things across. That's and, and you know you can make people happy. The thing is with comedy, it's healing, it's laughter, it brings joy, it's a release, it makes people see things differently. It can, it, it's not just healing for the audience or people laughing. It's healing for the comedian, and so I can do all of that. And when I do comedy, you know, I do feel like this is what I was meant to do, no matter how hard it is. I do feel like you know what this is what I was meant to do. It feels. Otherwise, I wouldn't still be doing it. And I do love that thing that I, I'm lucky. I feel like I've found this thing that I love in my life and I want to just keep doing it forever. And that's really interesting because I think when you find a career, especially if it aligns with your values and you're happy doing it, that makes a world of difference to you and the people around you. And that's it sounds like that's what you've sort of struck gold on, I guess. Thank you so much for your time, Shazia. It's been absolutely fantastic. That's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook, changing underscore suits, and subscribe so you never miss an episode.